This is a beginner's tutorial on how to use Fluid, the FLTK GUI interface builder. This is version 1.10 of FLTK. I'm going to start off by making an empty directory so that you can see how to start from scratch. I'm going to copy in one pre-made make file, which you can uh, pause the video to take a look at. This is the same FLTK make file that I used in the beginner's guide. To ring up Fluid, just type Fluid. And the first step is always to create a new project. So under File New, I'm going to type in hello.fl. FL being the file name extension for Fluid, and hello being the name of the project. So now I can start creating my program. Uh, the first step is to create a main function. So under New Code Function Method, if I blank out the function name here, it says blank for main, so it'll make me a default main function. Into which I can stick uh, either my own custom code or a window. And in this case, I'm going to add a window, which will be my main application window. And I'll resize it. And so now I have a working program. And I can save out the Fluid file, which will save out uh, hello.fl. And I can also hit Write Code, which will generate the C++ files. And I can look at those in here. So by hitting Write Code, it generated this hello.cxx and this hello.h. Let's take a look at the code that it generated. Here's the hello.cxx. Fluid generates pretty clean code. Um, here's the declaration for main. And here's the declaration for the FL window, complete with the width and height information. Then it ends the window definition and shows the window. And then Fluid adds this code, which calls the main application loop. And Fluid also automatically generates this include for hello.h, which is the other file that it generated. When I hit write code, let's take a look at that pretty simple file. Um, Fluid automatically adds the include for fl.h, and because I added a window to my application, it automatically includes fl window. And it also generates this little bit of code, which uh, prevents include file recursion. So I can make and run this program now. If I type and make, it'll run the C++ compiler and build the program. And then I can type hello, and it'll run it. Let me flesh this program out a little bit uh, by adding a button to the window. So I'm going to right-click on the window and choose button and that brings up the property editor for the widget. And I'm going to ignore that for now and just resize the button and position it in the window. Besides going into the DOS window and typing make and then running the hello program, I can actually set up Fluid to automatically save out the C++ file, build and run the program. Under shell execute command, um, I've got it set up here to open a DOS window, run make to build the program, and if it's successful it runs the program and exits. And uh, if it's not successful, it pauses so that the DOS window stays open while I can look at the error messages. And um, here is where I can set it up to automatically save the FL file and the write code option so that it generates a C++ code before it runs the make. So if I hit this button, it'll actually uh, save out the files, run make, and run the program. There's also a shortcut here so that it doesn't pop up that little interface, uh, execute again. And so if I just hit Alt-G, the little shortcut here, which I'll do now, it'll actually build and run the program. So here's the uh, compiler window, uh, complete with the output from the C++ compiler. And if my program were to print anything out, that would appear here. And uh, then it runs my program. Let me add a callback to this button by double-clicking on it, hitting C++, and typing in the name of the callback function, which I now need to write. So uh, let me go up here, click on main, and then say new function method. And I'll give it that function name, callback. And I'll pass in the uh, callback function, which is an FL widget pointer, followed by a void pointer. And I'll cast this to be a static void function, because all callbacks. And now I'm going to add some custom code to this. So I'll choose new code. And uh, I'll just change this default print hello world here to be button callback. So now I've made a little function, uh, complete with some code in it. And I'm going to hit the F2 key to uh, move it to the top so that it's declared above main. And uh, because I'm using the printf statement here, I have to include sta standard io.h because that fluid won't do that for me automatically. It doesn't know about anything that you put in the custom code window. But I'm just going to go ahead and build the program anyway so I can see the error message. And here it is. It's warning me that uh, printf uh, is undeclared. So let me add and include for standard io.h. So I'm going to click on main go into new code declaration and type in include standard io.h 
and then I'll hit F2 to move it to the top of the program. So now when I hit Alt-G, it'll build the program successfully and run my program. And now when I click on the button, I'll get my little button callback message here. We also add a callback for the window itself. So let me click on the window. So let me add win quit callback, which will be the callback that's invoked when I click on the X in the window, because window callbacks um, are invoked when you hit the X to kill the program. So let me just make a copy of this button callback here. So I'm going to select it and hit Control c Control v to make a copy. And then I'll just the function name to be uh, win quit. And I'll change the code to say window quit callback. And because uh, I want it to actually kill the program, I'm going to put in an exit here. And because I'm using exit, I have to include uh, standard lib.h, so I'm going to make a copy of standard IO here and change this to standard lib. And then hit F2 to move that to the top of the program. And I'll take the win quit callback and move it to the top so that all my callbacks are above main. And now I'll hit Alt-G. And uh, now I've got the button callback and the callback that happens when I hit the X button. And it's probably better to see that from this window because the, the DOS window disappears. When I hit X, it prints window quit callback and then exits the program. Let's take a look at the Properties Editor. If I double-click on the button and click on GUI, I can change the label of the button, which changes the label interactively as I type it in. Um, I can change the visibility of the button by uh, just toggling it here, and I can also change the active state of the button so that it grays out. And these will be the initial states of the widget when the program is executed. You can set the tooltip to this as a test. Uh, which will appear when the user hovers the mouse over the widget. And uh, let's compile the application just to see what that looks like. So now when I move the mouse over the widget, the tooltip comes up. Uh, one other thing you can change uh, for the window is uh, you can set it to be resizable. Uh, if resizable is off, when you run the application, the window will not be able to be resized by the user uh, clicking on the corner of the window. Uh, but if you have that turned on, then the user can resize the window by clicking on the edge and dragging. For the button under Style, you can change the font size just by dragging the number, or you can type the number in manually. Uh, you can set the font to something different, uh, Courier or whatever. Let's leave these at the default. Um, under C++, you can set the name for the variable for the button. In this case, if I type in uh, test button, this will be the variable name assigned in the C++ program. And if the public button is on here, it'll become a global to the application so that all parts of the application can see this by its variable name. And uh, if we take a look at the code that's generated, let's compile it really fast. And then take a look at the code. You can see where it's assigning the button and using the variable name that we assigned. And up here at the top is the global declaration for the button so that uh, other parts of the application can refer to it by name. One of the other things you can change in the Properties Editor is the user data that's passed to the callback. Uh, user data can be a number or it can be a string. Uh, in this case, test number one. And this will be passed as the second argument to the callback. Uh, let's modify the button callback to expect a second argument. We'll call it user data. And in here, I'll print out what the user data is. And I'm going to cast it as a const char, because um, when it's passed in, it's passed in as a void. So uh, to be correct with a compiler, we should cast this. And so now when I compile the application and run it, uh, when I push the button, not only should I get the callback message, but I should get the user data as well. The handy thing about the user data is that it makes a button unique. For instance, if you have multiple buttons, uh, like why don't I make a copy of this button by hitting Control-C, Control-V, and uh, one of the things that copying will do will copy the callback as well. So both buttons will be calling the same callback, but uh, we can change the user data to be unique. So this way, um, you can set up many of your buttons in your application to all be calling the same callback, but each one will be passing different user data.
so that your button callback can procedurally determine which button you pushed. Let's compile that. So now when I push this button, I get the test number one. When I push this one, I get test number two. This is also useful for file menus, um, like for instance in the fluid file menu here. All these items can be invoking the same callback, but each item can have a different user data associated with it. Let me add a file menu to this application. Um, select the window and right-click on it and choose Menu Bar, which will let me make a new menu bar. And then let me put a few uh, submenus in this menu bar. Uh, right-click on it, choose Submenu, and I'll call it uh, File. So now I have a file submenu with nothing in it. And let me add on a new menu item. And call that one Save. And so now I've got one menu item inside file, and if I make a copy of that, control C, control V, and change this to be quit. Now I have two menu items. And what I can do is modify these to both invoke the same callback, but pass different user data. So let me modify these by selecting them both, hitting F1, and going into C++, making them both invoke the button callback, and setting the user data for one of them to be file, save, and for the other one to be file quit. So now when I run the application uh, and push these buttons, uh, I get a different message for each one. And inside the button callback, I could procedurally test for these different strings and act accordingly. Let me now simplify the application back down again. Let me get rid of everything here and just leave a window. So let me go back to just having a button and uh, setting the callback to be button callback. One of the things that I skipped over was um, the ability to change the color of the button. Uh, in here, if I click on color under style, I can set the color to be something else. And for buttons, the selection color is the color of the button when it's pushed in. So in this case, when you push the button, it'll change to red. And let's just quickly compile the program so that now when you push the button, it changes red. And the same will happen when you make copies of the button. Uh, both buttons will, in this case, inherit the same color changes. So that way you can duplicate behavior uh, by setting the first one correctly and then making copies. One thing I'd like to cover is how you can get widgets to interact with one another. Uh, let me add another widget here, a uh, text widget, and move that over here. And let's set it up so that when you push the button, it changes the contents of the text widget. So I'm going to give the widget a name, and I'll call it uh, test input. So now it has a variable that I can refer to in the button callback. So uh, let me change this to refer to that and set the value to be something else. So now when I push the button, it should change the contents to be something else. Push it. And uh, yeah, no matter what I change this to, whenever I push this, it just resets it. Another thing I could do is read the contents of this variable uh, when it's been set and have it, for instance, run it as a command. So let me change the callback to, instead of changing the value. Let's tell it to run it as a system call. And uh, so I'll say test input. And in this case, I'll get the value and pass it to system. System is an operating system command that will run whatever the text string is as a command in a shell. So if I run this, now if I put in a command like dir uh, and then push the button, you can see the directory listing come up. And I can change the arguments like slash w, and when I push the button now I get that kind of a directory listing. So this way you can interact between buttons. And let me finally cover some of the other aspects of Fluid. Under Layout is an important setting, under Grid. Uh, this lets you set the spacing grid for when you're mouse dragging things around. Uh, right now it's set to 5-5, which means that when I click on a widget and try to drag it, uh, it'll step in units of 5. Uh, if I change that to be, for instance, 20 on the horizontal and 10 on the vertical, now when I drag things around, uh, they'll be stepping by that many.
And you can disable the snapping completely by changing these both to 1, so that uh, then when you drag things around, they drag around with one pixel resolution. I like to leave these set to their defaults. And if I want to move things around by individual pixels, I can use the arrow keys to move them, because the arrow keys will let you move individual pixels. I'd like to save everything else for the advanced tutorial, which goes into deriving classes and creating large-scale applications in Fluid. See you then.